All right. Hi, guys. I hope you can hear me. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk to you today about ocean acidification as part of this module, being biogeochemistry. And um, what I'm going to try and do is tackle this subject more from an ecological perspective, but talking about some of the necessary chemistry and physics at the same time. I gave this lecture the last two years and it went down pretty well, so hopefully it will this year as well, even despite the fact that we're having to do everything from home and via videos, which isn't ideal, is it? But I hope you're enjoying the module anyway. I guess most of you probably know who I am from social media and seeing me in, around Sam's before lockdown, but I've been in your position before. I was a bachelor student sitting in your seat, well, at least one of those seats, um, between 2006 and 2010. And that started for me a whole career in ecology, and I'm pretty grateful about that. Been on a lot of ships and done a lot of field work and been able to study some cool animals. We graduated in 2010, and that's what we looked like. There was just three graduates at that point, which is kind of funny. I always start presentations with that because I like the history behind it. And it shows how, bit, how much bigger unit, UHI has become and SAMS have become since 2010. Okay, so, I mean, maybe I put that there, you know, in order to kind of lighten the mood because it's about to get dark. Everybody knows about climate change, and at this point, I think a lot of people probably know about ocean acidification too, um, but I would suggest that when people think climate change, they generally think of global warming. Um, in terms of climate change, we know that that's caused by or at least part, partly caused by anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And it has massive effects on the planet, giving us some of the most extreme weather events that we've ever had and melting the ice caps. In terms of the carbon dioxide that's emitted, well, 29% is absorbed by the biosphere 45, most, most of it, remains in the atmosphere, and that leaves a third to be taken into the ocean. So that's why we call the ocean a carbon sink. And if it wasn't for the ocean, for sure there would be a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there currently is. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you make your own mind up. And uh, definitely the oceans have absorbed 30% of the carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide, since the start of the industrial period. What we're going to talk about now is the direct consequences of that absorption. So ocean acidification is really called the, the, the evil twin of global warming, right? So global warming is where you have an increase in temperature because of the greenhouse effect. Now, when that carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere, it ends up in the ocean, and what it does is forms a series of chemical reactions. CO2 combines with seawater, and that produces carbonic acid. And we're already starting to see the word acidification appear. What happens then is it dissociates mostly into bicarbonate ions, which we'll talk about in a second, because bicarbonate ions are very important to this to understanding what ocean acidification really is, and also produces a hydrogen ion. Basically, pH is a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions. And since the start of the industrial period, the pH has gone down 0.1 units. And maybe that doesn't seem like much, right? Because it's 0.1, but it's actually huge. And because that's a logarithmic scale. What 0.1 units actually translates into is a 30% increase in hydrogen ions. And the amount of hydrogen ions is very important for reasons which we will talk about, but certainly it affects the physiology of animals. And we're about to see it affect something else as well. So pH in the past, I wanna put the pH now okay, which is about 8.17, yeah, something like that, into the context of pH in the past. You can see over geological time, 
okay, this is millions of years, right? You can see that there is a good relationship, a strong relationship between pH and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So whenever the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased, the pH has decreased. And that's exactly what we're seeing um, even on a faster time scale over the last 200 years. Now, there's definitely been times when the pH has been lower than it is today, but those were periods when there was mass extinctions, and that wasn't good for anybody. Um, the, the, the two periods that come to mind when we think of much lower pH was 250 million years ago and 200 million years ago, the worst extinctions of all time. And yeah, indeed, you know, the past mass extinction events, all five of them have had a global warming component and an ocean acidification component. Both of those things have happened together. You could think it's happening now, right? Okay, ocean of acid blamed for Earth's great dying. I told you it was going to get dark, guys. But I, I will I will try to give a message at the end that's, that's positive and um, potentially implies that not all species are doomed. Okay, by this time, they were. Nearly every form of ocean life 250 million years ago disappeared during the Great Dying. 90% of all marine species vanished. There's direct evidence that ocean acidification dealt a final blow to species already suffering from these huge environmental changes. We'll also come back to that, right? Each, each problem that is happening in the environment can't be dealt with in isolation. It is working with other stressors to have synergistic effects and also unpredictable effects. And we always need to remember that, that you can't just treat ocean acidification or pH decrease as a, a, a concept in its own. That's what happened in the past, guys. And just one last thing here. If we look here, um, the pH really has not never been lower than about 6.2, and it's never really been much higher than about nine. Okay. Um, in the future, okay, the, the the oval, the black oval shape is where we are around now. And that's about 8.17, as I suggested. That's at the surface of the ocean. What happens in the future is not entirely clear, not entirely sure, because it will depend on what we call emission scenarios. It's basically about how much we're able to curb our emissions to reduce or mitigate the pH change. But these lines here of what might happen by 2,300, 2,500 predict different scenarios. Um, the worst case would be a business as usual scenario of emission where we just continue to emit as much as a carbon dioxide as we're emitting now. And then the pH could go down to about 7.7, .7, which is 0.4, right? 0.4 or 0.5 lower than what it is now. And don't forget that the change in pH levels historically of 0 0.6 units happened over a much longer time than 500 years, happened over 10,000 years. So that's what you need to remember here. It's not that pH has not been lower in the past. That's part of it. But it's the change at which the pH is getting lower now. Okay, I promise to you guys that I, I wouldn't just talk about pH because, well, pH is part of the story of carbonate chemistry, but carbonate chemistry needs to be addressed. And carb carbonate chemistry involves when the dis when carbonic acid dissociates, it diso dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Dissolved organic, it dissolved inorganic, sorry, carbon in the ocean is made up of three forms. And that's carbon dioxide, aqueous, Carbonic, no, sorry, not carbonic acid. Um, carb, you can say carbon dioxide, aqueous, and carbonic acid as one group. Okay. The second form is um, carbonate ions, and the third form is bicarbonate ions. And eighty-eight or so percent of the dissolved inorganic carbon is in fact the bicarbonate, the bicarbonate ions. Now, this this can be used by some organisms to build shells and skeletons, but the vast majority of shell and skeleton builders can't use it. They must use carbonate ions, which as you've already seen, are pretty scarce anyway. 
But this bicarbonate can potentially break down into carbonate and hydrogen ions. It doesn't happen very much though, because what will happen um, is that the, any carbonate ions that are produced or any carbonate ions that are available will rebind or will bind with hydrogen ions to produce bicarbonate again. So what happens, what you see is you see a, a real dominance of this one type of dissolved inorganic carbon, bicarbonate, and a real scarcity of carbonate ions. So any creature that uses carbonate ions to build its shell or skeleton will suffer. And that's what's happening here in an ocean acidification scenario. Because of these extra hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions that are being produced. Okay, so maybe you can tell me what these, or well you can't because you're not here right now. Send me a message. Uh, but what these, what these um, different pictures show, these two pictures show, in fact, it's two different forms of calcium carbonate that are found in mollusks, corals, and other animals. And also phytoplankton, because there are phytoplankton that have calcium carbonate. And one of them, for example, is a coccolithophore. These two forms are called aragonite and calcite. And I want to let you know that aragonite is much less soluble than calcite. So its dissolution is probably going to happen faster than for calcite. Some organisms have both of them. And it's a, probably a great time to tell you that, you know, there's a lot of different types of organisms that are calcifiers. In fact, uh, nine of the invertebrate phyla that we call bemphos, right, benthic animals, um, includes calcifiers. Facts. Okay, so the pH, again, uh, the amount or concentration of hydrogen ions affects the ability to dissolve or corrode aragonite and calcite skeletons and shells. We use this saturation or calcification state measured on a scale of zero to five. And that will, that will give an idea of whether calcification is even possible. If the saturation state is more than one, precipitation exceeds dissolution. So calcification will happen. Shell forming, skeleton forming will happen. And obviously that will depend heavily on the dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations and hydrogen ion concentrations. Where the uh, saturation state is less than one, this solution exceeds precipitation. So there's degradation and it will be very uh, hard, if not impossible, to maintain a shell or skeleton. Important to know that dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations are higher in colder waters. Now, that means cold waters um, in terms of geography and also in terms of deeper waters, which are also colder than shallower waters. And in these places, calcium carbonate is less likely to be able to participate. This graph shows exactly what I talked about there. Okay, the saturation state, the calcification state, is going to decrease uh, as you go down in the deeper waters of the Atlantic and the Pacific because of these lower pH and lower um, temperatures and higher dissolved inorganic carbon at depth. And we see that the level has gone below one, so therefore we're talking about, you know, undersaturation. Note this little symbol here, right? This omega, right? I think it's an omega. And that means saturation state. There is also a difference at the surface um, between the Atlantic and Pacific. And I'm not going to tell you the answer to why, but you might have an idea based on what else you've learned in this module. Okay, there might be a temperature difference, but there will be something else that's ha that, that you can say varies between this newer, this younger and older ocean. Okay, again, that will obviously hold true at the cold latitudes, the high latitudes, and the cold areas of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Indeed, we're, we're looking at light blue saturation states 
for aragonite. This is not calcite, this is aragonite, which is found in many organisms. We'll talk about some organism in a minute that does use aragonite that might suffer in the future. And the light blue color really suggests that, you know, we're getting towards the saturation horizon. It's not as critical right now in the tropics, but it might be later. That's in 1994. Of course, there's been studies making predictions about what will happen in the future. And this is a perfect time to say that I'm going to send Arlene some papers about ocean acidification. And she can send them to you on Brightspace, where all these data come from. Fabri et al. 2008 is a great paper for reviewing the knowledge and understanding. Right. In 2100, especially in the Antarctic, we're going to see um, the saturation state go below one. So we're going to see under saturation and a, a state where uh, calcification is occurring at a lower speed than dissolution. So therefore, there will be net dissolution and that's going to make it very hard for certain organisms to live in this place. And this is a prediction again. The extent to which this happens depends on many factors and also about our behavior, what we do to reduce our emissions. Historically, at saturation states like these that you will see in the surface in the future only occurred in much deeper water. Remember the graph that we showed earlier, this one here, there is a difference between depths, but at that point, we'll be looking at these kind of trends in the surface. Um, that's a median of 13 ocean general circulation models forced under the business as usual emission scenario. I think we've all been hoping that business as usual will not be the case. Okay, perfect time to move on to taxonomy here. I guess you guys remember all these major groups of organisms from first year. You've got bacteria, archaea and eukarya. And eukarya are, you know, eukaryotes. They comprise a lot of the organisms that we're about to talk about now. I'll stay away too much from prokaryotes and bacteria because it isn't really my area of expertise, but I will talk about one group. A few general points when it comes to animals, right? Animals and eukaryotes. Ocean acidification responses are currently modeled from individual organisms all the way up to the community. So the effects that we interpret or we gather from ocean acidification or any environmental change depends on the level that we're interested in looking at, whether that be the whole ecosystem or just one organism or just one cell, pretty obvious, but it needs to be said. Most of the evidence that we have of changes or effects of ocean acidification are based on short-term perturbations in the lab. Um, and it's obviously always a challenge to, to tell uh, whether what we see in the lab is exactly what these animals would do in the wild. There's a lot of things different in the wild that will affect the behavior and the response of animals to environmental stressors or any organism to environmental stressors. That is something that we constantly deal with when working with copepods in small test tubes in the lab. But we do learn some useful stuff. And for the purpose of our experiments, we will try to uh, replicate the natural violet environment as much as possible, although you can't ever do it entirely. The other important thing to say here is that when animals have been exposed to um, higher levels of carbon dioxide in the lab to see how they would respond to it, those levels are generally much higher than what we predict will happen in the future, at least in the short term future. So maybe the results um, you know, of that answer a particularly diff different question rather than maybe a realistic change. There's tremendous complexity in marine ecosystems. I kind of hinted at that, but there's lots of ecological relationships that occur. We've got uh, mutualism, commensalism, predation, competition, parasitism. Those are your five types of ecological interactions. And um, if you do a BBC module in fourth year, you'll learn much more about ecological interactions. But of course, if, an, if animals are interacting with each other, you need to factor that into how they will respond or if they'll survive. 
pH also um, affects well every level of the food chain indirectly and directly. A change in pH affects the bioavailability and uptake of nutrients that would be um, more or less available to organisms and the same for trace metals which could affect, for example, photosynthesis and then each subsequent level of the food chain. But let's start with the photosynthesizers, right? The primary producers. Phytoplankton are the subject of most ocean acidification studies. And why do you think that might be? Put that in an email. Um, there have been mesocosm experiments and field studies on phytoplankton and primary producers. Let's generalize and suggest that more carbon dioxide means more photosynthesis, so more primary production. Now, as a real generalization, because it will depend on species. One of the important points from this presentation, it's going to depend on species and we can't group all primary producers together. If you look at coccolithophores, coccolithophores can actually use bicarbonate and don't need carbonate to be able to photosynthesize. There will be changes in the phytoplankton composition and consequences. There always are. You quite often see changes in the size spectrum of phytoplankton with environmental stressors. And here you do, well, there's, there seems to be a case where ocean acidification is favoring larger diatoms and getting rid or, or, or harming the smaller diatoms. Diatoms are obviously very important to food chains. Problem here is that these larger ones produce less, interestingly, dimethyl sulfide. And that's one of these um, gases that might actually fight global warming and fight climate change. Um, so there's people all over the world working on DMS. Maybe you've heard of it. If we have less DMS production, we have to deal with um, the consequences of that in terms of a positive feedback to global warming. There's obviously going to be changes in carbon flux and there will be consequences in that regard in terms of how much carbon is sent onto the seabed with ocean acidification. Lower pH is generally associated with increases in C to N and C to P ratios. Okay, okay you've got more carbon. You've got more dissolved inorganic carbon. and But that actually affects the nutritional value. So it will affect the reproduction and growth of primary production producers, consumers, such as copepods, and as I'm suggesting, arrowworms. Here's the, the bacteria, you know, uh, <laughs> blue, blue, sorry, blue green algae, so to speak, um, that need to be mentioned because in all the mass extinction events that occurred in the past, guess who does well? It's that guy. So you might expect the same with OA. I put this here because SAMS has a big focus on macroalgae and on seaweed, but seagrasses could do well with climate change, well, sorry, with ocean acidification, it's generalization, of course. Something that won't probably do as well are your pteropod mollusks. Now, the mollusks are a key group that calcify. Some mollusks use calcite, some use aragonite, some use both. This one is only using aragonite. Um, and remember that that's the most soluble form of calcium carbonate. These um, pteropods are also called sea butterflies, and they're um, consumed by, amongst other organisms, sea angels. Uh, sea angels are also mollusks, but they have uh, they they lose their shell before they or when they metamorphose, so they don't have it when they're adults. But the sea butterflies do, and what they do is they kind of flap around in their shells. Various studies have examined the effect of these, um, and the shells dissolve in a short time period. Importantly, these are very abundant at high latitudes. And the loss of these organisms, which can be up to 1,000 um, individuals per cubic meter, could be very important for carbon flux in the Arctic, for example. There's some experimental results that show that the pteropod shells are get, get thinner, you know, when exposed to um, a lower level of pH and a higher level of hydrogen ions over time. It's a rapid change. 
the food web uh, dynamic and the ecological interaction dynamic is already clear here because there is a terapod, sorry, there's a, a hermit crab called um, Teropagurus spina, and it only uses, it only seems to use pteropod mollusks, uh, sh shells, as its home. I'm fascinated by hermit crabs, and in fact, any type of crabs, having um, had pom-pom crabs and decorator crabs and Sally Lightfoot crabs and all those cool crabs that do very cool things in my aquarium in the past. Um, this one is really making its home out of the shell, and if that disappears, then you would expect the crab to suffer as well. Stony corals. Now, I know that some people from SAMS, some students um, who graduated from SAMS in recent years have went on to work on coral reefs and go diving in the Red Sea. And I would love to do that because I've really got a history in cold water. It's time to move to the warm water. But reefs are more likely to have to occur above the aragonite saturation depth for obvious reasons. Um, that the, the, the depth at you know, which calcification has a net, you know, uh, net calcification, that nets a net um, kind of uh, precipitation over dissolution, that's where you're going to find reefs. In general, increasing CO2 results in lower calcification rates, as you would expect from what we've talked about earlier. Um, the, the effects of, the effects that are, are the impacts on corals right now and on coral reefs are significant and um, varied from using suntan lotions to the coral bleaching that occurs when global warming causes the zooxanthellae to leave their tissues and leave them blanched but ocean acidification clearly plays a role on top of that and they really are victims unfortunately the option is to upregulate the calcification rate but there's an energetic cost of that if an organism is going to change its um, rates of metabolism to address the problem of ocean acidification, it loses out in other ways. And the question is whether it's worth it. Yeah, we know that there's been declining coral calcification on the Great Barrier Reef. However, and this is where it's important to consider each species by itself, the aragonite calcifiers um, have molecular pumps, right? Okay, the coral calcifiers at least have molecular pumps that actually allow them to regulate their internal acid balance. Fish are pretty good at that too. Um, and they actually, fish, we'll talk about that in a minute, especially uh, teleos fish, can actually excrete the hydrogen ions, otherwise known as protons, to uh, you know bring their acid balance back to something that's kind of more normal. That buffers them from external changes in seawater pH. Interestingly, and I'm coming back to my crabs again here, it ah. seems like the studies on crustaceans, um, many of them show an increase in shell growth at lower pH. And that could be because like some corals and like your coccolithophores, they're able to use bicarbonate. They also are covered in an extensive biogenic covering and that can buffer their calcium carbonate structures from direct dissolution in acidified seawater. Their shells are constructed differently from other shells um, of, for example, pteropods, because they have an epicutical layer. And that's important and it's a good defense as well. But we should remember that we can never group all organisms in a major group like crustacea or, ph or phylum, you know, even arthropoda and say they'll all respond the same because they won't. It will depend on so many factors. Some tissues are found in certain organisms may be more tolerant to pH change than others. And um, that may be the case for gelatinous animals, for example. Although for gelatinous animals, there really isn't much known and we need to do more on the effects of OA. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, energy is allocated to basal ma maintenance extracellular pH um, so, or, or everything else. And extracellular pH affects these processes. For an organism that has a high metabolism and high, high respiration rate, the process of oxygen binding is more sensitive to pH changes. Um, it has to be 
because of how oxygen is delivered throughout the body. So you, you could say that some organism that has a higher metabolism could uh, face more risks from ocean uh, acidification and the, let's say, the decrease in oxygen. But the teleos fish, for example, is a very good acid-base regulator, and that's because it's able to get rid of hydrogen ions from its body. Deep sea organisms have limited control, on the other hand, of intracellular tissues and low concentration of low transport proteins. So they might they might be more likely to um, struggle with getting rid of hydrogen ions. Um, buffering extracellular carbon dioxide is energetically expensive, and organisms that live on the sea floor in deep water live in a very uh, slow environment with we we could say less food than maybe is in the epipelagic. Now that means that they want to conserve all the energy they can. And many organisms actually enter diapause in deep water, which is like a hibernation stage, including copepods, which also do this migration to get there. We'll talk about the migration in a minute. Um, but there is definitely a reduction in metabolism that happens in the deep water animals that, you know, again, very low metabolism or very high metabolism could pose more risk to them. This, all, all of these uh, examples and many more are found in this book by this great scientist called Gattuso. Now, Gattuso really is a guy uh, in ocean acidification research, and I'd recommend that you read that. Jean-Pierre Gattuso. Okay. Um, so... I did want to say at that point that we need to remember that each species is different and some species will be more sensitive than others. Uh, metabolism plays a role. The ability to you know, buffer or have um, buffering capacity will definitely impact the effects or the impacts on animals. Um, if you're a calcifier, that's going to be a problem if you only rely on aragonite potentially and you don't um you can't use bicarbonate um and if for example you're living in high latitudes there's challenges there too so the options for impacted marine populations are you migrate you accl acclimatize you adapt or you go extinct it's pretty simple and we know of course that uh, migration or acclimation acclimatization are not always possible what adaptation is possible in different organisms in 100 years? Okay, well, phytoplankton, they actually have up to 100,000 generations in 100 years. So they might have the best chance to adapt to adapt to these changes that are happening in their environment. Fish is much less, but fish are able to do pretty good acid-base regulation. And there's been one study suggesting that the levels of uh, the, the, the change in pH that is likely by 2100 might not affect fish too much but we don't know for sure and again species cold water coral doesn't have any generation in 100 years um it has less than one so it populations really suffer in that case you know because recruitment will be low ocean acidification represents a very large rapid change in ocean chemistry with potential to affect biodiversity and function of a number of ecosystems Tropical reefs are cradles of evolution. There's many species of organisms that only live in coral reefs. Coral reefs are around coral reefs or depend on them. Coral reefs could suffer because the at least many species on the reef um, calcify, and some of them only use carbonate. High latitudes, there could be problems because the aragonite saturation depth is shoaling, um, and certain species that live in high latitudes are very fragile and are only found at high latitudes. Multiple stressors are happening. What's the combined effect of increased temperature, increased ocean freshening? In terms of the phytoplankton, ocean freshening has effects on phytoplankton depending on their size. There's a paper that's called um, the smallest cells, algal cells thrive in a fresh ocean, a fresher ocean. The ocean is freshening because the ice caps are melting 
uh, adding more fresh water into the ocean and there's more influx from rivers into the Arctic. And the cells that are smaller will be more, more able or more capable to utilize the available nutrients. Um, ecosystem shifts are one of my last slides here. I love this. It allows me to come back to zooplankton because I will. And uh, zooplankton are interesting because they migrate massive distances in the water column. Your pteropod might do that too. Krill, interestingly, lay eggs, uh, Antarctic krill, in very deep water. Unfortunately, it's cold there, and we know that these cold zones contain a lot of dissolved inorganic carbon and have lower pH. So they actually, because of their migration habits, put themselves in the danger zone. But then they'll move back up again, and they'll, they'll, they'll encounter a wide range of pH. Copepods will do the same. Arrow worms will do the same. How they deal with that, we don't know. But let's talk about what might happen in the future with zooplankton. Okay, right now you've got a situation where if it's cold and ice covered, large diatoms do well. And they're going to be consumed by copepods that are large too and have a lot of fat. Part of the reason they have a lot of fat is because they feed on those large diatoms. And uh, they're juicy. Previously, we called them the McDonald's of the ocean because they contain a lot of fat. But it's good fat, maybe unlike McDonald's. And consequently, planktivorous predators like your little oak, Ali Ali, specifically die for these animals and choose these animals, pick these animals. If these animals, um, you know, suffer in the future because of environmental changes, then the little oak could suffer too. I think a lot of people will have an issue with that. And unfortunately, we do think that a change in temperature by two to three degrees will really suffer and um, cause the lipid rich copepods to um, suffer or disappear. What will happen in that scenario of warming is that they will be replaced by smaller copepods, such as Calanus famarchicus, which contains much less fat, is much smaller. And it's not going to be little ox doing well then. It's going to be planktivor, it's going to be your um, herring and your fish. Um, and they will be, they will attract more whales, such as your grey whale. So you could see an entire ecosystem shift based around the change in temperature, and we could maybe see the same thing for ocean acidification if ocean acidification has the same effects on um, size or composition of the community. There are uncertainties to all this. Experimental challenges mean that, you know, animals that are analyzed in the lab may not reflect what they do in the wild. There's few impacts on uh, sorry, few studies on multiple stressors. I've said that many, many times. Too few studies on the early life history stages. And obviously that's so important because whatever happens in the larvae, you know, it decides whether it even makes it to adulthood. And there's many zooplankton that are metoplanktonic. So they have a larval stage in the plankton where they're moving up and down. There's uh, two, uh, sorry, no information currently on gelatinous groups. They're very important to food webs. I'm kind of thinking now about my next project, which would hopefully be on feeding and keating nafs. So maybe I'll come back to that. But we know that jellyfish are an organism that could do well in future scenarios. Um, overfishing, global warming, lower pH. It seems like jellyfish handle that better than most. To what extent do natural populations display ecological buffering whereby species replacement and selection equals functional stability and resilience? How resilient are they going to be? Um, what can they do about this? Okay, we've talked about the clear cost of ocean acidification to organisms, but it will affect us too because it affects commercial fisheries. I mean, you know, the mollusk production in the United States is $100 billion. Um, and in the UK, 50% of all landings in the UK in 2011 were shellfish. So these are calcifying organisms. Um, calcifiers could suffer in the future, as I've mentioned. That creates problems for jobs, especially fisheries. I, I put this here because even although it's ironic, it's true. You know, there's certain organisms that will do well. There's going to be winners, there's going to be losers. There is evidence, though, that you know, calcifiers um, such as corals, uh, porites, acroporis, that can use bicarbonate and other organisms that use bicarbonate, they might be okay. 
but we still have a lot of work to do. And maybe that's what the work some of you guys can do in the future will be. Maybe projects or maybe work after your bachelor's. Okay, guys. So I'm going to finish there. What we can do now is Arlene will put this online. You can watch it tomorrow. Message me if you have any questions. I don't think that there's, you know, clear answers to all this. So if it's not about, you know, basic biology or basic chemistry, a lot of it is still open for discussion. And I'd, I'd love to hear your points about what you think will might happen in the future with ocean acidification. So thanks for listening. I hope you have a good day. Okay, I'm going to stop. Bye.